For most of the 140 years since the invention of artificial cements presented the modern world with a new building material, concrete has been used for structures above grade in the United States and Canada. But because it was first used crudely as a substitute for stone in foundations, retaining walls, machinery bases, silos, blocks, and small dams, its coarse, uneven surfaces had little appeal to architects accustomed to dressed lumber, quarried stone, and brick. In fact, for the first 60 years of concrete construction in America, few architects gave either their names or much of their thoughts to concrete structures. What must now stand for concrete architecture during that period was accomplished by tradesmen, farmers, mechanics, and inventors. What they liked best about concrete was it was easy to mold, fireproof, and cheap. Probably the oldest standing concrete structure of any pretension was built in 1844 at Milton, Wisconsin by William Goodrich, tradesman and innkeeper. He hauled imported cement to Milton by wagon and with recruited farm labor mixed a fluid grout of cement and sand and poured it into box forms filled with river gravel. The hexagonal shape of the tower, whose massive bearing walls were reduced in thickness by six inches at each story, was probably chosen to produce more vertical stability for a molded structure without buttresses, columns, or integral beams. Goodrich's diary gives few important details of construction, but states often that his fireproof cement grouted building cost but one-sixth of that of a similar structure made of other available materials. It remains in excellent condition, occasionally repaired by stucco patches. In 1852, Horace Greeley, famous editor, farmer, and advisor to young men, built a concrete barn at Chappaqua, New York, using small stones and a thin cement mortar. After Greeley's death, the barn was remodeled into a house and was decorated by adding cornices dormers and window bays so that it looked this way 25 years ago. In recent years, stripped of its Victorian finery for modern upstate New York living, its rugged, undamaged walls are again revealed. At Taunton, Massachusetts in 1855, Benjamin Wood built himself a flat-roofed house with concrete bearing walls. It is today a sound, handsome example of good maintenance over the years. Since Henry Heath in 1858 designed and built the Allen Hotel in Honesdale, Pennsylvania, the first concrete building in Pennsylvania has been continually open to the public. Its 18 inch thick walls were raised one course at a time by hod carriers who climbed ladders to dump concrete from buckets into low box forms. The superstructure, including 12-inch thick partitions, was sufficiently sound to warrant complete modernization of the interior in 1953. In the 1860s, many concrete buildings were erected by unknown or now forgotten artisans. One was Trinity Chapel at Excelsior, Minnesota, a monolithic rectangle with steep-pitched roof. Its walls were made by packing a dry, coarse mix of concrete into 15-inch deep forms. The near-perfect walls, after a century of Northland weather exposure, were prior proof of the water-cement ratio theory of concrete mix design formulated 55 years later in 1918. In 1861, several concrete houses were built in Danvers, Massachusetts. Two of them, of which the better known is Putnam House, were designed in the then fashionable octagonal shape. In 1867, Union Free School was erected for District 13 in Kingston, New York. Its thick concrete bearing walls and partitions were finished with smooth trowel stucco. Treatment of windows, the only decorative features, was similar to that used on brick and frame buildings of that time. Kingston youngsters still answer the morning bell at number 13. Some of the worst and some of the best things happened to concrete as an architectural and structural material in the 1870s. In this decade, concrete was first used 
to simulate the ashlar pattern surfaces and structural details of medieval and classic styles developed for stone. Because it was so easy to mold concrete in any form, it suffered the curse of eclecticism and was rarely used as a material with character of its own for more than 50 years. Punkhockey Congregational Church, Kingston, New York, was built in 1870 as small-scale Gothic. It has unfunctional stepped buttresses, lancet windows, a sharp spire, and finials that blew off during the 1936 hurricane. The wall surfaces were scored to resemble stone. An architect, Robert Mook, designed this monolithic concrete house in Port Chester, New York, in 1872. But its owner and builder, William Ward, a mechanical engineer, is far better and more importantly remembered. For the entire house, coined walls, floors and partitions, Tuscan columns, French roof, and medieval battlemented tower was reinforced with light cast iron I-beams and rods as indicated in this detail from Ward's original plans. The pierced window balconies were probably the first use of concrete to produce tracery. This first reinforced concrete structure was completed five years before Thaddeus Hyatt obtained the first American patent for reinforced concrete. A monument to early concrete technology, it stands today grandly on its hill. In 1884, St. Augustine Cathedral was built in Florida using shells for concrete aggregate. Later, Carrere and Hastings, the noted Beaux-Arts academicians, designed the first Methodist church in St. Augustine, a Romanesque monolith of coquina aggregate concrete. Before the decade was over, Henry Flagler, railroad tycoon, financed the flamboyant Memorial Presbyterian Church and so many other classically styled concrete hotels, office buildings, and arcades that the old part of St. Augustine today looks like a transplant from the 14th century. In 1891, Ernest Ransom, a contractor, built Leland Stanford University Museum in steel reinforced concrete from designs originally made for sandstone. He also used bush hammers to produce a distinctive texture. The few cracks in the concrete wall above the textured dado was all the damage caused by the earthquake of 1906. The notable seismic resistance of this structure was an important reason for the use of concrete for public structures in California ever since. But Ransom is more distinguished as the developer, if not the creator, of the exposed reinforced concrete skeleton frame with glass curtain walls. His factory buildings in Massachusetts and Pennsylvania at once outmoded the old solid wall with narrow slot windows for industrial buildings. This was a new concept in design and the first time probably that concrete was given a character of its own. It was widely adopted by all factory engineers and builders and this may be why American architects failed to see its aesthetic possibilities. Plenty of concrete frames were built, of course, but they were visible only from back alleys, curtained with rough masonry filler walls. But the open frame with glass curtain walls was greatly admired in Europe, where architects adapted it to a new concrete architecture. Ironically, it bounced back to America 50 years later in the Bauhaus-inspired glass boxes which reared high in American cities during the 1950s. In 1905, Montgomery Ward and Company in Chicago set a record by erecting a concrete frame warehouse with concrete curtain walls 800 feet long. While exciting developments in concrete were largely confined to industrial plant design, American architects continued to use concrete in traditional forms. St. David's Church in Baltimore in 1906 included classical and Romanesque details with heavily coined walls. In 1905, Price and Lanahan designed the Marlboro Blenheim Hotel in Atlantic City, then the largest reinforced concrete structure in the world. Its form was traditional, but the architects avoided using concrete as a substitute for stone and did not add facing decoration to cover up the concrete surfaces. 
The most original use of concrete at this time was Frank Lloyd Wright's Unity Church in Oak Park, Illinois in 1906. A cast-in-place monolith with exposed aggregate surfaces and elaborately molded detail, Wright said of it, this is the first building in America to be cast complete, ornament and all in forms, and then let alone as architecture after the forms were removed. But Wright and many other architects became disgusted with concrete, and for good reason. The rock-faced concrete block, identical units molded to resemble rough-cut stone, was in high favor with builders. A cheap imitation, Wright said, and abominable as material when not downright vicious. But Wright kept on using concrete anyway, designing his own concrete block and decorating scores of his famous houses all over the country with blocks and panels molded in strong three-dimensional detail. This is the well-known Barnsdall House in Hollywood after 43 years. Reluctance to use reinforced concrete in architecture could also be blamed on a lack of information about the nature of Portland cement and lack of reliable methods for mixing and handling concrete. This often resulted in bad concrete, careless workmanship, and botched surfaces due to sloppy concrete and leaking forms. From 1905 on, two national associations, the Cement Users, later to become American Concrete Institute, and the Cement Manufacturers, later the Portland Cement Association, undertook studies to develop uniform controls, standards, and tests for cement and for the design and handling of the material. By 1920, it was no longer necessary for architects, engineers, and contractors to design and build concrete by empirical methods. Good concrete could be specified and produced if anyone wanted to do it. Meanwhile, Bucks County Museum, the most fascinating concrete landmark in America, was built during 1914-16 at Doylestown, Pennsylvania. It was designed and erected without services of architect, engineer, or contractor, and with the help of only one skilled worker, a boss carpenter, who directed the labor of scores of young neighborhood farmhands. Designer and job superintendent was Dr. Henry Chapman Mercer, lawyer, anthropologist, and collector of colonial implements and tools. Probably the first in America to recognize the true plasticity of concrete, he planned his 115-foot-high building from the inside out, providing galleries of various bay areas and floor heights to accommodate the dimensions of thousands of exhibits, including Conestoga wagons, a fire engine, cider press, and a gallows. There were no drawn plans or model the several floor areas often were planned and built on the spot around the exhibit materials. This produced an irregular arrangement of columns and floor heights. All the ceilings are vaulted, formed by mounds of earth, sections of wood barrels, or bent metal sheets. Windows located to illuminate particular areas vary in shape and size, and all these two frames and mullions were cast in concrete. Dr. Mercer, the obvious forerunner of such modern masters of plastic design as Le Corbusier, topped his building with steeply pitched roofs of five-inch thick concrete. Location of steeples, chimneys, and dormers was his only concession to aesthetic design on the whole building. Dr. Mercer's fine hand, here molded in the wall near the top of the museum in 1915, also guided several other remarkable concrete projects. He started Font Hill, his castle-like home in 1910, using an old wood frame farmhouse as the inside form for a concrete enclosing envelope. The old house is therefore intact under the lower portion of the building. The tower area, probably the inspiration for his later museum, is five stories high, but the vaulted ceilings were arranged on 10 elevations accessible by literally dozens of straight and winding, cast-in-place concrete stairways, which make modern split-level dwellings look elementary indeed. Dr. Mercer may have been the innovator of double-glazed picture windows with concrete casements outside and wood frames inside. He protected eight to ten small balcony areas with molded handrails 
and pierced many portions of the five-inch thick concrete roof with skylights. He made a monolithic spring house, half sunk in the ground, and later decorated it with ceramic tiles and what may have been the first concrete grill block. To house the manufacture of hundreds of thousands of ceramic tiles and sculptures with which he covered the vaulted ceilings and massive columns of Font Hill, Dr. Mercer built a pottery, a rambling concrete structure with more than 20 kilns. It is still in use today. His last building project, and his favorite because he thought it reflected his growing experience with plastic concrete, is a carriage house and studio converted from an old barn. He cast concrete around the original barn walls, then added bays and a concrete roof. Most of the dormers were molded as multifamily birdhouses. For his amazing feats in design and construction, Dr. Mercer was awarded the Craftsmanship Medal of the American Institute of Architects in 1921. This was a hopeful conclusion to 80 years of experiment with a new material that often showed high promise, but had won very little recognition by designers or the public.